Hello, and welcome to another episode of Ethanol Producer Magazine's podcast. I'm your host, Katie Schroeder, staff writer with EPM. This week, we are chatting with Dan Wood from Kite Technologies. Welcome, Dan. Do you want to just introduce yourself to our audience? Yeah, hi. Yeah, my name is Dan Wood. I'm with Kite Industrial Analytics and have been with them for eight years or so. As you can probably tell, I'm based in the UK, but most of our ethanol work is actually in the US, as you would expect. But I'm, yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me on this, and I look forward to it. Sweet. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Dan. So could you just share a little bit about what Kite is all about and what your technology offers ethanol producers? Sure. Kite, we exist because of a piece of optical technology that was developed here in the UK that we have developed into a an analytical instrument which is designed specifically to operate in production environments. So lots of analytical instruments are designed to look nice and shiny sitting in a laboratory somewhere, but simply would not be able to survive out in a production environment. What we've done with the optical invention that we patented was to develop an analytical instrument that gives you essentially HPLC type data, but in real time, while mounted into your process. And so from an ethanol perspective, we look at everything from liquefaction, propagation, the kind of workhorses in fermentation, and increasingly we're looking at distillation and able to measure all the key chemicals of interest in all those processes in real time. So what we're really doing is we're enabling the ethanol industry to get onto the the digitalization bandwagon, call it Industry 4.0 if you want, we can generate very significant analytical data in real time that allows true process optimization. That's really exciting. So can you talk about kind of what are your star technologies, the ones that you would encourage ethanol producers to consider when they're kind of equipping their lab and and moving toward this digitalization? Yeah, so as I said, most people's labs have got an HPLC. And in fact, I don't think I've ever been into an ethanol plant that doesn't have an HPLC in their lab. And everybody's running temperature sensors, certain amounts of dissolved oxygen. There'll be people looking for biomass. But essentially, the, the, the analytical workhorse is the HPLC. But the problem with that is people are taking five, maybe eight uh, HPLC samples in a 50-hour, 48-hour, 50-hour fermentation cycle, and they're blind in between. So in reality, by putting spectrometers on each of your key measurement points, you're getting the value of that that detailed data that you're used to from HPLC, getting that in real time. Now, where this gets really interesting is people are starting to look at plant optimization models based on grind feed rates, ethanol drop. You're looking at some ethanol content and whole stillage. You're looking at contaminants in the distilled ethanol. And the, the really exciting point is when you've got the high value kind of analytics running real time, I think then we'll see the development of the process optimization models and there'll be a chance to throw artificial intelligence in there because that's what everybody's doing with everything at the moment to get AI-driven plant optimization models. But those wouldn't work without the high quality data that you can get from a spectrometer, but you can't, for example, get from a thermometer or a DO probe or something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. So can you talk a little bit about what your Ermadillo technology is and how it's able to be so resistant to interference in harsh environments? Yeah, sure. So I won't turn this into a spectroscopy lecture, not least because I'm not really a spectroscopist, but mid-infrared spectroscopy is where we operate. So I'll have to touch on a bit of this, this technologically, so bear with me. Spectroscopy is the science of, essentially, if you throw light at a chemical substance, basically at anything, that substance you're looking at will absorb certain wavelengths of light. It's all to do with the vibrational nature of molecules and different molecules or different bonds specifically within those molecules vibrate at their resonant frequencies and they absorb those frequencies of light. So basically you throw in a known pattern of light into your sample, in this case the the kind of the fermentation broth or the distillation liquor or whatever. And some of that light gets absorbed by the the chemical species, the chemical bonds inside that liquid. And then we look at the light that comes back out. What we're essentially analyzing is the difference between the light we put in and the light that came out. So we can work out what's been absorbed. 
And because different molecular bonds absorb different frequencies of light, we can work out, I say we, it's actually a, it's a piece of software, works out based on the difference of the light that's gone in and the, different, and the light that's coming out, can work out what the light has passed through, what molecules the light has passed through. So we can build a model that says, okay, if these bits of light are missing in these quantities, then I'm looking at ethanol, or I'm looking at water, or I'm looking at DP4 or DP2. So that's kind of fundamentally how spectroscopy works. Now, the mid-infrared spectroscopy, you can get spectroscopy that happens in uh, the visible spectrum, in ultraviolet, in near-infrared, in mid-infrared. And each of those tell you slightly different things. For chemical characterization like we're doing, you want to use the mid-infrared because those are the frequencies at which the bonds actually vibrate. So some of your listeners or your readers will have used near-infrared before which kind of goes part of the way to what we do. But it's the near-infrared region of the spectrum is not the range where the bonds actually vibrate. They, they actually vibrate in the mid-infrared. So if you can use a mid-infrared okay. spectrometer, you're getting the real deal. Mm -hmm. the, the, the issue up until now, and sorry, this is quite a long answer, but it's, quite, it's actually quite a complex question. The other stuff that's out there, other mid-infrared spectrometers use a mechanism that is quite fragile. Okay. And if you try and put that in an operating environment, it breaks. Mm. Right. There mm -hmm. are a couple of people who've done it, but they really aren't very satisfactory. The technology we are bringing to market is based on static optics, and it is separately patented. It's a completely different optical way of doing spectroscopy. But because it's all static, we align the instrument in the factory, we then bolt it all down, and you can literally hit it with a hammer, and it keeps working. That's important. <laughs> it's totally, yeah, that's why we exist. Awesome. That's super cool. So can you talk a little bit about the installation of this technology, how it fits into the process? And then if I was a producer, how would I insert the probe into my process? And sure. how do I handle cleaning it and doing maintenance? Yeah. Okay. All good questions. So essentially the, the instrument looks like a kind of large shoebox with a okay. uh, kind of one and a half inch diameter probe coming out of it. The probe is about mm -hmm. I work in millimeters. It's about it's about 200 millimeters long. What's that? About eight inches long. So there's a probe about eight inches long and an inch and a half in diameter coming out of this large shoebox size. And we need to get the end of that probe in contact with the liquid that we're measuring. So in fermentation, where we actually tend to go is into the recirc loop. And okay. while CIP is going on, we need somebody to cut in space for a flange and a or approximately one and a half inch um, diameter port in there that we can mount on and we then flan we have a flange to flange connection that supports the the instrument into that um, process so essentially we need to be mounted where we're in direct contact with well mixed sample which is why we tend to go in the research loop because you know that's all being pumped and mixed and and is good and homogeneous you then connect up to the DC, to your DCS so it's it's putting live percentage concentration values back into your control system whether it's delta V or whatever else you're you're using so the installation is pretty straightforward we've never had any issues you need a you need a cutter and a welding torch and a mechanical engineer and you're in from a cleaning point of view we actually have very few cleaning issues uh, in this Great. industry we work we work in other industries where they get a horrible kind of chemical deposition on any surface that's going the ethanol space is pretty clean by our standards. Um, so, I mean, as I said, every now and again, you can, I mean, people take them out, to clean them, have a look at them, show them to somebody. As long as in the firm where you've got CIP going on, that CIP process generally cleans the probe as much as it cleans everything else. So um, nice. they just get left nice. there for months, for months on end. Yeah. Nice. Well, that's convenient. <laughs> And then my last question is, are there any trade shows we can expect to see Kite at in the coming months going into 2024? So, yes, we are waiting for the announcement of the date of the, the co coincidentally called EPM, isn't it? It's the Ethanol Production Managers Meeting, Winter oh, okay. Production Managers Meeting. Mm. I think we're still waiting for an announcement of the location and the date, but we will be there. Obviously, we'll be at, at FEW. We've been <laughs> at FEW for the last four or five years. It's our kind mm -hmm. of, it's the first show that is a banker for us every year. Mm. I think it's an awesome show. And we are going to be at the National Ethanol Conference and we'll be at FEW and we will be at the, the Winter Production Managers meeting when they tell us where it's going to be. Awesome. Well, that's um, really exciting. 
if you have listeners and readers in Europe, we you've just missed us if you didn't catch us at the World Ethanol and Biofuels, which was in mm. Brussels two weeks ago, three weeks ago. But that's uh, that's another good one. But FEW is our nailed on uh, show. But we wish we didn't have to wait till June. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. for sure. Awesome. Yeah. I think my last question, I'm wondering if you have, for one of our listeners walked away today and wanted to summarize this podcast as someone, what, what is the thing you would want them to take away? I would want them to take away the fact that the way you run your fermentations at the moment involves taking HPLC every six or eight hours. The analogy for me is if you were trying to drive to your destination, would you drive with your eyes closed for six hours and then open mm. your eyes, try and work out where you were mm. and then close them again and hope that at the end you'd, you'd end up where you wanted to be? Of course you wouldn't. That's what HPLC forces you to do. What we enable you to do is have that quality of information right now all the time. So the moment anything starts going wrong with your process or slightly suboptimal, we can tell you that and you can catch that quickly. So why wouldn't you drive with your eyes open using a spectrometer? Why drive with your eyes closed? Mm. That's awesome. Thank you so much. That's a, gr a great way to go out on this uh, podcast. And then thank you so much for your time, Dan. It's great chatting with you. Thank you. Absolutely. And for more podcasts like this, I encourage our listeners to visit ethanolproducer.com and subscribe for more industry updates. Thanks again to our listeners. Until next time.